All right, now that we've introduced the idea of a p-value, let's sum up a lot of these ideas that we've been talking about with this graph. So, as we talked about before, when you're trying to decide whether to reject an all hypothesis or not reject an all hypothesis, we like to see how far our estimate is away from some theoretical value. We do that by calculating a T statistic or a Z statistic or an F statistic or some other kind of statistic. And what that does is allow us to calculate probabilities and answer the question, how likely is it that my estimate could just randomly be this far away or farther from what this null hypothesis says, this theoretical value? Or another a way to rephrase that how unlikely is it that my data came from a world where this null hypothesis is true how unlikely is it that I could see data like this um, and the lower that probability is that you could get an estimate like you did if the null hypothesis is true you start to doubt that null hypothesis and so we looked at uh, the average IQ of a hundred null hypothesis and a sample size of a hundred before. So as we discussed, as your estimate gets farther away from this null hypothesis value, this theoretical value you're testing, it becomes less and less likely that you are seeing just some random effect. Right? There is random variation in samples, but the farther and farther away your random sample gets from what your null hypothesis says, it gets less and less likely that that's just a random effect and maybe there's some other good reason why you're getting an estimate so far away. So a few bullet points here. Yeah, remember a sample estimate is random and a sample estimate whether it's a mean, a median, a standard deviation or anything else, a slope, an estimate can be any random number. Anything. However, it is likely that your estimate will be close, closer to whatever the truth is than some other random number, right? So your random sample is, should be pulled towards what the truth is, what the true mean is, or the true slope. So if you find that your estimate is very far away from your th theory or whatever your null hypothesis says, then either your sample is just odd, just at random you happen to call everyone who has a high income, or just at random you get 20 head flips in a row, or just at random uh, somebody deals four aces off the top of a deck, right? It could happen, but you have to always keep in mind your theory could be wrong. Don't cling to a theory just because you like it. You know, the evidence, once it gets so overwhelming, you need to get a new theory. So what we calculated last time was the probability, a p-value. And that, that p-value calculates an estimate of how unlikely it is that we could get us an estimate this far away or further away if the null hypothesis is true. And as that probability gets very low, we reject the null hypothesis. So after we calculate how unlikely it is your sample just randomly was that odd, if this probability is tiny then at some point it has to become more likely that your theory is wrong. So you always have two directions you're pulled in. Number one, you don't want to ignore evidence suggesting your null hypothesis is wrong. But at the same time, you don't want to be too quick to jump the ship to abandon a null hypothesis that could be right. So there, there are always these two competing ideas. So keeping all this in mind, let's look at the graph one more time. So if you got this estimate of 103, that is two standard errors away from your null hypothesis of 100, most people would probably reject the null hypothesis and say, well, since there's a 95.44% chance that I should be closer to 100, if 100 is the true mean, I'm going to reject the that and say that the true mean's probably not 100. It's probably something closer to 103 that I got. It could be 106. 
could be 102, could be 101. And you know it could be 99. There's always that possibility. Now when you decide to reject a null hypothesis, there is the chance that that null hypothesis really is true. It really could be 100. And so the probability in this case that you could see, again, that, that estimate that's 103 or further away, when the null hypothesis really is 100, that probability, an estimate of it, is uh, 0.0456, 4.56%. So there's always this chance that you're rejecting a null hypothesis, but you're wrong. The null hypothesis is true, right? Now there's al always also the case, uh, the chance that you could not reject a null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Let's look at what that could look like. Okay, let's, let's suppose that your null hypothesis is the same thing, that the average IQ is 100 and you take a sample size of 100 and the standard error is 1.5 and you expect there's a 68 percent chance that uh, the sample mean should be within one standard error of 100 and a 95.44 percent instead of getting a sample mean of 103 suppose this time you get a sample mean of 101 right now that 101 is right where you would expect the sample mean to be if the true mean is 100. So suppose you, what would you do? You'd say, well, I'm not going to reject the null hypothesis that my, um, that the true mean is 100 because I haven't found evidence that it's not 100. 101, that's pretty close to 100. It's less than one of these standard errors. I'm not going to reject the null hypothesis. Suppose you wake up the next day and you find a news article where someone has proven beyond a shadow of, the, of a doubt that the true mean is 103. Right? They've, they've proven this. There's no two ways about it. You did not reject the null hypothesis that the true mean was 100 because your sample mean was, was pretty close to 100. But you wake up the next day and somebody has proven that the population mean is 103. You were wrong. You were wrong not to reject the null hypothesis. But it doesn't mean that you made the wrong decision. You made the best choice with the information you had. You didn't reject the null hypothesis because you didn't have a reason to. But still, there was an error made. And nobody's going to blame you for it, but uh, there was an error made. Because your data didn't tell you to reject the null hypothesis when in fact it was false. So these kinds of errors happen all the time. Sometimes you don't reject a null hypothesis when you should, and sometimes you reject a null hypothesis when you should not. It's just the life of a statistician. So let me introduce these vocabulary terms to you that you've heard if you've had a statistics class. A type 1 error is what we call alpha and you choose alpha. Now most of the time people tell you choose an alpha of 0.05. Well I'm not going to tell you to choose an alpha of anything. It depends. But alpha is the probability that you decide on. You have to sit down and choose this. It's the probability that you're going to reject a true null hypothesis. Because you have to decide what, uh, at what level you're going to decide how far away your sample estimate is from what the null hypothesis says. You have to decide when you're going to start rejecting. But there's always the chance that you're rejecting when the null hypothesis is true. So most people say choose alpha equals 0.05, but we'll talk about this a little more. Now that other kind of error is what we call a type 2 error, or beta, and that's the probability you will not reject a false null hypothesis. Now I say except here. Now most people don't like this language, and I shouldn't do that. So the probability that you will fail to reject is uh, a false null hypothesis is a little bit better way to phrase that. But it's going to depend on alpha that you choose. It's also going to depend on your sample size, how much evidence you've collected. And in the next video, I'll give you an, a metaphor for understanding what these things mean. Now, the p-value we calculated, 
uh, that estimates the probability that you could randomly get an estimate farther from the theoretical value, just randomly, assuming that the theory is right. And the lower that p-value, the more likely you are to want to reject that null hypothesis. If the p-value is less than alpha, reject. Otherwise, don't. And power, that's a theoretical concept that we'll also discuss in the next part. It's 1 minus beta. 1 minus beta is the probability that with the evidence you're collecting, you could detect a false null. If you're using a test with low power, it's going to be hard to reject a null hypothesis when it's false. You're just not going to find it. That's what we call a low power test. Now also 1 minus alpha, that's what we call confidence, the confidence level of a test. And we'll go through all these terms with an analogy or a metaphor in the next part.